Welcome, everybody. Uh, I think we can pay the uh, Hello, highest compliment from our campus to you, which is a totally full room on a summer day. Yes. That's quite extraordinary. Thank you for welcoming. <laughs> um, and uh, Jonathan was actually curious, and I am too, about who's in our room. We have a number of people, I think, listening online. But uh, let's just slice and dice it. How many folks generally turn out for Berkman Klein Center stuff? So you're turning out for this too. How many people generally turn out for Johnny Sun stuff? So you're turning out for this oh, too. Hey. Okay, the softball teams create themselves. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, how many people have followed Johnny on Twitter for at least a week? Okay. All right, that's uh, everybody. <laughs> the rest of you, you have your chance. Uh, any other demographic questions you want to I think ask? that's great, yeah. It sort of gets us started. How many of you are having a good day today? <laughs> All right, yay. It just got better. Yay. How many of yeah. you consider yourselves an alien? <laughs> All right, that we could revote at yeah. the end. Yeah, all right, yeah. Um, and we thought uh, in the spirit, often torts is taught in this room. Um, so in the spirit of tort, not that of injury, but of Latin, uh, we have a principle called res ipsa loquitur, which is the thing speaks for itself. So we thought to start us off, we might do a little res ipsa loquitur with some of Jomney's tweets. Sure. So, yeah, I'm going to go over here and DJ them. Um, but I, I, Jay-Z asked me to pull up some of my like favorite tweets that I've done. You want to embiggen it? Yes. How do I... I control plus usually does something. Or control Command shift plus. plus. There we go. There we go. In beginning. <laughs> okay. Do I do I need to read these out loud or can you all read them? I was me. Good night, moon. Moon. Night. Me. Good night, stars. Moon. WTF. <laughs> me. Sorry, wrong number. Moon. Who stars? Who is stars? Answer me. <laughs> um, this was like kind of in relationship to like uh, the the Joe Biden um, Obama memes. Uh, Biden, come on, you gotta print a, a fake birth certificate, put it in an envelope labeled secret, and leave it in the Oval Office desk, Obama, Joe. <laughs> um, this is kind of like the spirit of my entire um, writing like project. Look, life is bad, everyone's sad, we're all gonna die, but I already bought this inflatable bouncy castle, so are you gonna take your shoes off or what? <laughs> Um, another one of my favorites. On Earth, a magician puts his hand in his hat. In the rabbit realm, the hand emerges. It is time. The rabbit council must choose a sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, this one's a bit of an explanation, but uh, I tweeted this, uh, and I said, o OMG, Will O. Smith and Jada N. Smith um, with Google search result images of uh, Will, Will Smith's middle name, Oliver, and Jada Pinkett Smith's middle name, Naomi, which refers to their kids, Willow and Jaden, right? Willow Smith and Jaden Smith. Um, it went kind of viral, 50,000 likes, uh, but I doctored these search results. So their, their middle names aren't actually Oliver or Naomi. I think it's like Christopher and Corin or something. Um, but this was kind of like, I preceded the fake news um, <laughs> thing by tweeting this in or late 2015. And so, so this was like a fun fake news piece, um, as opposed to every other fake news piece. And I thought, given the tech uh, thing that we're in right now, as a child, I asked my dad why the moon looks really, really big sometimes. And he said, simulations always have bugs, and I haven't slept since. <laughs> so yeah, that's a little intro on me. Uh, I'll flip it over to the PowerPoint. And we just, I just put some uh, pages from the book in the back, so we can kind of loop it as we go along, and hopefully it'll like it'll help us set the tone for That's this. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I, I can't help but also, by way of introduction, this is a lovely book, by the way, available over here after the presentation. And there are fewer books than there are people, so you know. So run, <laughs> Lord of the Flies. Um, when he isn't tweeting, Jonathan Son is an architect, designer, engineer, artist, playwright and comedy writer, mm -hmm. which is a fairly long list of things. Yes. Uh, but tell us about, first, the title of the book. Sure. Authors choose their titles very carefully. They often have second thoughts about it. Everyone's an alien <laughs> when you're an alien too. Yes. A book. Yes. I love how the subtitle is. Oh, book. it is a book, yeah. <laughs> um, 
ex explain what's going Unless on. Unless you think yeah. it speaks for itself. I, I mean, I, I think um, this is one of the things, this title kind of came about after I had done the book, and it's a line in the book, and it's one of those things where when you see the line in the book, you'll be like, that's the title of the thing. Um, and it's kind of the uh, entire theme of uh, both the book and my work in general. Um, I think I kind of have floated through the world as feeling like an outsider and feeling a bit um, like an alien, I guess. And along the way, I've met so many other people who um, have felt like that too. And I think this is a celebration of that kind of diversity and of that kind of um, outsider dumb. And are aliens, I, I remember my dad once told me that when he went to college, there were a bunch of fraternities. Sure. And then there were people who didn't join the fraternity who joined something called the non-fraternal union. Okay. And I was like, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> is that not? A fraternity. Yes. <laughs> like, no, no, it was the non-fraternal union. And we had meetings and did activities. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and memberships. And right. Yeah. So um, are aliens a cohort? Mm -hmm. Or is the whole point of being an alien that when everyone else is an alien... Yeah. Aliens from one another. Yeah, I think there. I think like I love that delightful paradox. It's kind of like the nice version of like when everyone's special, no one's special. <laughs> um, and this maybe this is like the positive uh, like flip of that. When everyone's an alien, you're an alien too. And I think that's um, it's part of saying that like being an outsider is uh, okay and kind of a uh, celebration of that. Um, and I think that we can kind of spend more time kind of celebrating everyone else's differences and um, making that the highlight instead of kind of celebrating similarities. Yes. Yeah. Now, and some of the wonderful to read coverage of you profiles uh, in anticipation of the book, mm -hmm. you've been described as sort of, uh, it's probably the kind of thing like the anarchist club had better not have a president. I assume weird Twitter does not have like a leader. Sure. But certainly a denizen of weird Twitter Mm -hmm. um, yes. If we were playing word association, tell us about weird Twitter. And demographically, how many people, I don't know if this is like asking if you're a hipster, because, <laughs> but how many people would say weird Twitter? Yes, I identify. All right, so not that uh, many. Yeah. yeah, well, weird Twitter was like a thing, I think, around 2012, 2013. Sure. Oh, yes. Here, let me do this. Um, weird Twitter was a thing around 2012, 2013, I'd say, like this, this movement um, of loosely connected comedy people who were writing with anonymous accounts and just like messing up everything about Twitter and like, and making uh, weird aesthetic like uh, miscues and misspellings and, and messing with grammar and syntax and um, really just using like Twitter as this uh, text-based medium uh, in a way that I'd never seen comedy used before. And so it was like totally absurdist, totally surrealist, um, but also kind of like reminded me of like the Fluxus movement from the 60s, um, which was like a group of poets who uh, really looked at like the aesthetic of like the form of the type that showed up on the page and yes. played with that and, and um, were, were exploring the effects of um, what that would do. To so that's a, it's a fascinating explanation grounded in syntax. Mm -hmm. But I guess if our medium is our message, right. um, there's also, is there a, a message having to do with what you were talking about before about diversity or outsiderness or something? Or yeah. anybody can use wor weird syntax. Well, I found that um, the underlying spirit of like that kind of movement was uh, that, and someone, there, was a, there was a tweet that said, I don't think we're using Twitter for what it was intended for. And I think that was kind of like the spirit of the whole thing. It was this totally like subversive um, kind of rebellion against the platform itself. And I think that's what I found so fascinating because at that time, I think a lot of what Twitter was being thought of was things like, I'm eating a sandwich, or like, go watch my movie, or like, go vote for my party, or whatever. Um, and then all these people came in with no desire at all to kind of use it the way that, um, that other people were. And so it was, they were, in, in a sense, everyone was trying to break Twitter by, by doing this. And you speak about it kind of in the past tense. Mm -hmm. um, is weird Twitter no longer weird Twitter or around because its aims were achieved? Twitter now is purposeless? <laughs> yeah. Or what, what, what caused the end of weird Twitter, as you would describe it? I mean, I think like so many um, online communities and online um, like little groups, they kind of they have their moment and they kind of work for a while and then they um, naturally like fizzle or disband or um, people just start kind of, it starts 
being this small thing and it starts getting more and more dispersed. Woodstock can only be so many days before the mud takes over. That's right. And like, and I, with, like, with, and I always have to say with quote weird Twitter unquote uh, because that was not a label that anybody liked. <laughs> uh, it was a thing that was beautiful because it was small and no one knew about it. And um, at the time, like having 200 followers was like a special thing. And um, eventually it just became more and more popular and I think more and more people were paying attention to it and because of that there was this lifespan where you had like the the genuine first kind of wave yes. people who were doing this yes. and then uh, it got some attention then other people coming in who were essentially trying to mimic the voice and like the aesthetic of it without like necessarily grasping the spirit of it and so you had like the second wave of people and then those waves eventually kept going until the voice or the kind of look of it was what people. There were was going some kind for. of business book, like how to sell your product on weird Twitter. Yeah, and that's kind of like that's like the weird thing about like the monetization of like internet content anyway, right? Is uh -huh. that um, as soon as something get, gets like catches flame, other people want to use it for their own purposes, you know, whether to like grow a following or to get enough um, kind of eyes on it to sell something. Yes. Um, and so it, it kind of like became disbanded that now way. Now some of those tweets you showed as mm -hmm. demonstrative of your account had tens of thousands of retweets. Sure, and you've got yeah. like a quarter of a million followers? Uh, 400,000 now, yeah. God, yeah. 400,000 <laughs> a week. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so do you have a secret account, kind of like Jerry Seinfeld wearing a mask to uh -huh. do stand up to where you're well, it's, things out. it's funny because this is supposed to be that. This was yes. supposed to be like the secret um, place that no one was supposed to know about. And somehow now it's what I'm known for. Um, no, I, he did not answer the question. <laughs> and, yeah. But I do not, I do not, oh, I also do not have a secret secondary account. I like kind of treat this as like my personal yes. um, place where I get to voice all this stuff. So I, I do see it as like my personal yes. account and not a character thing. Now in the public eye, when people talk about Twitter these days or wring their hands over it. And there's a mm. lot of hand wringing about what has Twitter become, sure. what kind of yeah. overall experience is it. Tons of negativity, cynicism, mm. outright hostility, misogyny, you name it. Yeah. Um, you now have a high enough profile that you could have a target on your back, metaphorically, uh -huh. rhetorically yeah. speaking. Uh, and yet, I think it's safe to say your representation there and within the book mm -hmm is never, it seems, with cynical distance. Right. Maybe with distance, but with an earnestness yeah. that you would think would make trolls salivate. And yes. I'm curious what your experience is now, yeah. having the profile you do, yeah. tweeting with the form and content that you do. Right. Well, um, I think like part of what I, I, I'm trying to do is and maybe not explicitly, but have like a, create like a, pos a positive space online and um, ha like practice empathy and um, kind of create little moments of kindness and delight and joy, um, especially given kind of like the cynical, like poisonous wasteland of the internet as it is right now. I think having those little moments. Let the record show he's saying that with a smile, <laughs> which doesn't mean he doesn't believe it. it just, right. yes. yes, it's it's a challenge to, to play with. Um, but like, I think because of that, it's um, even more important to like try to create those moments um, where people kind of see things and kind of feel a little bit. And do you relaxed. have a sense of the reception of that? I mean, I imagine your mentions, like what is it, like RIP my yeah. mentions? Yeah. Are your mentions, my mentions permanently resting in peace? Or are you sifting through them? There's, yeah. And is it a Skinner box? Are you like, you know, <laughs> something gets a ton of stuff, you're like, all right, more of that, and then uh -huh. oh, this didn't get good reaction, less of that? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to, I mean, like, part of the joy of Twitter is, like, having that instantaneous response. It's kind of, like, um, the closest you can get to mimicking being in front of people doing a stand-up set, right? Because you get the immediate reaction from people. But at the same time, there's a danger of, like, looking at those numbers and turning it into data. And, it's like, like during the debate when they turn the dials and Frank Lutz is like, that's it, Trump's going to win. Yeah, exactly. There, yeah. Like, there's two, there, there's a, a, a danger of, of doing that and kind of um, turning into, like, a parody of yourself, I think. Um, so part of it is, I, like, my mentions are kind of a mess. And you asked about, like, the kind of harmful speech stuff a little bit. Yes. Um, and I do have like a, a target on my back, and I do have like a, a very dedicated group of, um, of of trolls and people who 
who <laughs> hate I was me. like, props to them for their devotion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, shout out to them. Shout out for <laughs> sticking around for four years and continuing to do this. Have you engaged with them? Because so much, too, of your mm -hmm. work, almost every instance we see yeah. is a dialogue of sure. some kind. Yeah. It's not a pronouncement. It's, uh -huh. it's a dialogue. Yeah. And so how much of your work when you're on Twitter is posting the dialogue and then on to the yeah. next versus engaging in dialogue, sure. whether with people who yeah. are either trying to pick the ball and carry it further or just react and say, great, or react as one of your devoted trolls. Right. Um, I think like I've, the book is kind of a celebration of, like it's, it's fun because the main character of the alien is mainly a listener and mainly like a, a more on the quiet side and um, someone who would rather kind of learn about everyone else's lives than like project their own lives to everyone else. And I think it's part of the challenge for writing the book was creating a protagonist that the world, like the story is centered around, who actually doesn't do a lot of the driving of the story. Who would rather kind of take the backseat and listen? And I think that kind of reflects In my every alien. yes, yeah, yeah. And I, I think I would that kind of reflects my um, view of like. Twitter best practices in a way. I used to like respond a lot to haters and get in fights and kind of pick fights or like retweet them into my timeline so other people would pick fights with them. Mm. Um, but now I'm kind of more um, okay with just like seeing that stuff and kind of being like, okay, I hear that. But I'm not gonna respond. Like, I I'm can't tell if this is a journey where you'll where you'll end up as Cory Booker, who has <laughs> these wonderful weird owns of love back. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. I think there's. I mean, there's so much, and this is something like Susan Benish is here, um, and like we've kind of been talking about like harmful speech online and the role of humor um, in in kind of being able to counter harmful speech online uh -huh. positively or in a productive way. Uh -huh. And that's something like I'm really interested in finding the like the balance of, yes. of how to how to do it in a way that kind of um, devol de escalates the conversation yes. instead of making it And humor has, I think <coughs> So acknowledged. I was thinking of Mark Twain's thing about uh, a lie gets around the block faster than the truth sure. while still putting on its shoes yeah. kind of thing. But there's maybe a corollary to that where humor can reach people in a way that just earnest declarations of what you think is true fired at them like a Gatling gun. Right. Um, but humor also, if it's to have that element of shift of surprise of whiplash that mm -hmm. is often what humor is, yeah can be misinterpreted, can be misunderstood. Right. People might not understand that this was sarcastic, especially when you've got 140 characters. Yes. Do you yeah. find yourself pulling back from something that is humor, but you're already anticipating the eight ways 10% yeah. of the people seeing it are going to find it horribly offensive? Right. Um, I mean, I, I do spend a lot of time um, like figuring out what the right way to like to, to write a joke, a short, a short piece. And I like, sometimes I'll spend like half an hour just like figuring out the wording and figuring out the angle for these things. Um, I think there is a huge danger of, like there's a quote that I think it goes something like satire doesn't work if the people who are like mainly the fans of it believe it's true, right? Like there, there are a lot of... I always wondered about all the people that watch The Office. That's right, yeah. They're like, oh my God, those goofballs, when they're, many of them work in offices. Right, it exactly. It might be the goofball. Exactly, or people who think The Onion is like a real newspaper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. Or the Colbert Report was... Absolutely, right. it was like a big, yeah. like, there was a big Republican fan base for that. And I think there's like that, that get, that's get, gets um, kind of like magnified online, right? Um, there, because of how short the, the snippets are, like the tweets are, um, there, there's like this huge chance of it getting misinterpreted. And I think there's like part of what um, I'm trying not to do is I'm trying to stay away from like the ironic side of Twitter. Like there is kind of this, this voice of irony, um, which to me is kind of like being a jerk. Then if people think you're a jerk, you're like, ha ha, gotcha. I'm not actually a jerk. I was just pretending to be a jerk. Kind of like tweeting fake news. Yeah, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this weird, um, yeah, exactly, <laughs> you're right. So, that was in 2015, so I've stepped Which away from that. Which was just me being a jerk. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Um, but there you is... You have to agree that quickly. Yeah. But I mean, like, there, like there's, um, there is 
something about uh, like the online discourse that the, the, those misinterpretations, like when we're in person, we can just like agree and be like, oh, that's great. And we like yes. agree and move on and like we yes. get each other. Yes. But then online, there's so many ways that these things can like get misinterpreted or like you pass by each other. Yes. And so um, sometimes those like deep levels of like satire or irony, I think, are um, more counterproductive yes. than, than productive. Now, it's trite to call some of these amazing tweets gems, <laughs> but they have the, a gem-like quality, maybe, mm -hmm. of I'm curious how long they spend being polished and sort yeah. of buffed and prepared. You mentioned it might take half an hour to kind of get it right, mm -hmm. but at the beginning of the half hour is maybe when you had the idea, or you might be working on something for like a week. Um, it, it really depends. Like sometimes yeah. it just comes out fully formed. Like the moon one, the goodnight moon one, was just, it just came out. Like in, yes. in like, just like fully formed and I just tweeted it. Yes. Um, and I remember it like was exactly 140 characters and I'm like, yes. this is a sign. This is fine. I'm just yes. going to put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think like I, I, I treat it like any other writing project. Like I don't treat it differently from um, playwriting or sketch comedy or, or writing essays or anything. Yes. Um, I, I kind of will... I have this notes thing on my phone that I just like, anytime I think of something, I'll just jot it down real quick and then I can refer to it later and just keep going back and like, and figuring out if there's something, there's an angle or something that I want to say with it. Uh -huh. And um, it, there is like this process of, I guess, like writing the ideas down and then figuring out which of these is worth kind of exploring more and then kind of polishing it. So I think I'm like, I, I really want to try to like boost, um, like the con like the work that people do on social media as yes. um, a, a genuine form of I yes. guess creative output, and it seems like there may be no topic explicitly off limits mm -hmm. for you to engage with the book. As I look it over, can sometimes flip from the most uh, from whimsy, mm -hmm. maybe even twee, mm -hmm. suddenly into existentialism. Like on the next page, our alien encounters like a skeleton. Yeah. And it's like, it's mm -hmm. dead. Yes. It's like, oh, this is a baby that's really all grown up. Right. And then somebody else is like, don't touch it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> next page. Yes. Um, yes. And I'm wondering, it's, it's like, I don't know, I could revisit. Should I give this to my <laughs> seven year old nephew? Right. Or, yeah. Uh, and uh, you did a tweet in the wake of one of the recent mass shootings, sure, I think, yeah. that said something like the year 2030. Yeah. And then it was, son, dad, what were things like, uh, what were mass shootings like when you were a baby? Yeah. And dad says, believe it or not, son, they, they weren't every day. Yeah. And like. That's right. That's a, so I don't know, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about, is there any topic off limits mm. for this modality for you? Um, I think it's just finding uh, finding ways to make it. Um, that's a really good question. I think like part of it for me is like finding ways to to make it uh, to take a specific thing and kind of generalize it a little bit and make it um, a piece that not only applies at the moment but applies like five years later, mm -hmm. um, ten years later, and something that you can go back to and both see it as like a snapshot of um, what was happening at the time and then also. Um, still like relevant or applicable later on. I, I don't think that by like by um, principle there's anything that I want to like shy away from, but I do think there are a lot of topics that I recognize as like of like a straight uh, like cishet male um, that I like that I, I'm not in the right position to be the one making these statements. Uh -huh. And so I, 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 I like to um, use Twitter as also like a platform to get to expand other voices and to kind of be the microphone and kind of give uh, a platform to other people who I think have a better perspective and a better um, clearer way to say some of And does that things. mean a healthy dose of like retweeting without comment kind of stuff? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And um, and finding people that um, I really, whose perspectives I really appreciate and, and kind of boosting, signal boosting and, uh -huh. and kind of finding ways to to do that productively. And are there people who did that for you back in the day? I think so, yeah. I yeah. think that's kind of how um, like social media works. It's like you kind of make friends and you kind of figure out who, um, you find like kindred spirits in a way. And I think like the cool thing about Twitter is that even though it is uh, like it's through text, it's short pieces, oftentimes you don't even know like what the person looks like that you're kind of interfacing with. Um, but I think be maybe be because of that, you get 
um, a truer sense of who they are in a very strange way. Like I've had so many uh, meetings with people that I've known through Twitter um, who have become like my very close friends. Um, yeah, and like there are there are there are so many cases where I feel like the first time I meet them in person, if I followed them for a while, I already know who they are, mm. and like I've I've skipped like the first five times hanging out with them, yes. and like I'm on to just like already being their friend, and we kind of like start. It's like we're picking up a conversation instead of starting one. Ten years ago, the Van Berkman Center hosted Wikimania 2006 here on campus, oh, cool. and. Uh, it was just amazing to see all of the meetings of Wikipedians that had only known each other on the, oh, so you're Hot Pants 15. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was like the first meeting of the ARBCOM in person, the Arbitration Committee. And it's like, you know, you were expecting, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg to turn up and other sure. people in robes. And it was just like, oh. <laughs> like, but they still emanated power, let me be clear. Um, you had a great McSweeney's piece. Uh, oh, it was sure. a dialogue with a stand-in maybe for you or somebody uh -huh. maybe gently trying to push Twitter to increase the character size and Twitter mm -hmm. explaining again and again why it would never do such a thing. Yeah. Uh, if you had root access to Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, what's the one change, if any, you might see yourself wanting to make to it? I think like the biggest issue Twitter has right now is um, with issues of like harassment and abuse. Still, it's it's been the problem with the platform I think since um, it's be the beginning. Yes. And I think it's like I understand it's like a very difficult situation, but amongst like everyone, like all my friends on Twitter, and I guess amongst everyone um, I kind of interact with, the common thread is like if we can get, if we can kind of curb the amount of like negative, harmful speech getting targeted towards us, um, we're all going to want to use it more. And I think a lot of the, um, the public perception now is people are kind of resistant to joining Twitter and to getting on it because they're afraid of, of um, tweeting something wrong and getting like, a lot of kind of targeted and stuff. And do you have an instinct? Uh, is it loosely, come on, people, just make some decent rules or standards and then invest what it takes to enforce it? We all kind of know it when we see it. Uh -huh. Or is it? No, we have to innovate entirely new design features or something to... Yeah, I mean, there are like some very... I think there are basic things like finding the neo-Nazi groups and like banning their accounts or something, um, which I, like, there was, a, there was um, a, a, a piece that I saw recently where I think like Twitter uh, banned neo-Nazi... had like deleted neo-Nazi accounts that originated from Germany because that was German law, mm. um, but refused to do it in other like mm. for accounts from other countries, which means mm. that they, there is a capability of like finding and targeting those accounts, yes. um, but kind of like an unwillingness to do it unless it's like yes. purpose, like unless it's like documented and illegal yes. Got in it. the country. So I think there are like there are elements of that as well. Got it. Yeah. Certainly, much more to explore there. But why don't we open it up? Uh, anybody want to ask a question or make an interjection or begin a dialogue for which we need to get a microphone to you if that's the case? Uh, Sarah, yeah. Welcome back from vacation. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice and to see you. Feel free to say who you are. I'm Sarah Newman. I am a creative researcher at MetaLab and a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. Um, my question is about the drawings. Yeah. And if you could talk about your style of drawing, um, what inspired it, sure. um, how you feel it works with the text, and also about sort of audience, whether you feel like it changes the audience, expands it, limits it, or whether there's different audiences for sort of some people are more drawn to the drawings and some are more drawn to the text. Yeah, totally. That's a great question. Um, so like I'd, like, um, I'd also been like working in visual arts for a long time, and this was kind of like a thesis on, uh, well, this was all basically a tribute to like the, the types of books I read as a kid. And like there's a bit of like Bill Watterson, Shel Silverstein, like Morris Sendak, um, all the like kind of delightful and a little bit dark and a little bit like thoughtful um, writer, illustrator type people. And that's kind of the spirit I wanted to get across with the illustrations. I've also um, was very interested also in like the parallel to Twitter and like creating a metaphor to the experience of being on Twitter through the book, which is um, like very loose, but I was interested in like creating drawings that were very iconographic, right? And, and um, reduced to like this minimal, minimalism and simplicity. Um, 
that allowed you to kind of see them as like icons or avatars and stand-ins for um, actual people. And so that was like the, the digital design side that I was thinking of as well. And I think for the audience, um, I'd hope that it kind of appeals to anyone who like would pick it up and just see it and be like, this is a strange kind of cute thing and maybe either I'll like it or like my kids will like it. Or and again, it has the reassurance that it is in fact a book. It is in fact a book, <laughs> yes. And I was very, very excited that uh, my editor let me put a book on there because he was like, everyone's going to know it's a book. <laughs> um, but I thought that was like a cute little, uh, like it's, it was also like a cute thing to say like, you might know me from like my work on Twitter, but this mm. is um, like a this is a very adamantly form. a different form, yeah. like um, yeah, a launching point into a different kind of medium. Yeah. So, yeah. Other questions over here? We have to get a mic over. I had a, uh, I had a question about your spelling, and if you uh, yeah. if there's any pattern about it, or if you kind of. Are just a really bad typer, or uh -huh. <laughs> or if you, you kind of like type out what you actually want and then go back and change each letter. And I notice on your tweets you do the same yeah. spelling errors. Mm. So I was kind of wondering about. Yeah, do you that. have an auto incorrect tool? I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question. I mean, like the the fun thing about the typos and like again like that um, messing up of like the aesthetic and the visual was. Um, I think people attribute it to me now because I think I'm the only one who kept doing it, who was maybe the only one foolish enough to keep doing it. Um, but like, I think when like around the quote weird Twitter uh, like zeitgeisty thing, um, everyone was kind of playing with form and like playing with uh, messing up typos or grammar and syntax and stuff. And there was this spirit of like just breaking the English language. And so I kind of found my own way to do it. And like my inspiration was kind of like the fat thumbs kind of thing where um, most of the typos I make are not phonetic, but um, like keyboard-based, like adjacencies. So like a li e ben, the b and the n letters are next to each other than the keyboard. And so, so you could do a Dvorak version of your misspelling. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Somebody should write the tool. <laughs> um, yeah, but a lot of if the- If this, then bat. Yeah, that's right. And um, a lot of them are, uh, yeah, are based on like the, um, the, the keyboard adjacencies. There's like bn's and then replacing n's with m's a lot. Um, and things that uh, eventually I actually created a style guide for my copy editor for the book. Um, <laughs> because when they did when, your copy editor get danger pay? Oh, yeah, I mean, like <laughs> seriously, when they when they when like they we, I met about doing the book with Harper Collins, they were like, uh, our copy editor is gonna like want to kill you. <laughs> and so to make life a little bit easier, I did make a style guide that was like, okay, if you see this, that's an intentional one. Um, but but if if you see a typo that isn't on this list, that's probably a real typo. So like they had to cross reference my actual style guide. Um, yeah. So there is like a consistency to it, and something that I I tried to create. I love that you can be so punctilious about typos. Yeah. No, I love right. them. <laughs> yeah. Great. But only the right kinds. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's also interesting because I was thinking that in a way it was meant to uh, emphasize the alien as new sure. and different and yeah. still learning and all that, the way somebody who has any language as his or her second one yeah, would be. Yeah, absolutely. But this is not that. This is just it's it, Yeah, and it, it's a little bit of both because um, I think, like, I mean, growing up, like, as someone who wanted to be in comedy but was an Asian male, um, I was very aware of, like, how my identity kind of became the butt of jokes a lot of the time, and a lot of the time it was based on a misunderstanding of language, and I never wanted it... Uh, I think because of that experience, I never wanted uh, my humor to sort of be exclusive mm. and laughing at someone for not knowing something. And so instead, I really tried to make this um, something that uh, was sort of an inclusive thing. And part of the like the learning a new language aspect of that, which I do want to keep in this, um, was really creating like a new type of of learn like gram grammatical error because I didn't want to fall back on like um, English as a second language type mm. humor, mm. or um, or like immigrants coming to America and having to learn English type humor. Um, I, I really fo focused on like creating a voice that was different and unique from that, mm -hmm. and hopefully separate from that type of literally joke. alien, yeah, rather than the terrible deployment of the word for people not from here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Susan, you you play this irresistible, adorable, <laughs> cute 
um, bewildered creature sure. or <laughs> alien um, on Twitter, mm-hmm. you also sometimes at least seem to be very much playing yourself and mm-hmm. revealing um, uh, some some quite intimate uh, details of your own self and your emotions. And from what I've observed, your followers mm-hmm. assume that that's real, that that's yeah. real in quotes, that it's you. Yeah. Uh, and seem to tremendously appreciate that you're, for example, willing to say, I feel sad. Mm. Um, could you talk a little bit about that as a part of sure. this phenomenon? And, and is, does it have something to do with why uh, the trolls may salivate but not go after you? To pick up sure. Jonathan's question. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think like, I think like part of the... Um, thing that I stumbled into with the account is that um, I found like actually having a bit of an avatar and a bit of like a a identity distance um, or like crafting a new identity has actually allowed me paradoxically to be more honest and to be more myself. Um, I think there's, I feel like if my face were like literally attached to this um, and my like full properly spelled name were attached to this, um, I wouldn't be able to, to be as honest and to divulge as much like on it, like information as I do with this account, and I'm not really sure what that phenomenon is, um, but I'm really appreciative that, of that. Uh, I also think there is like this this balance between character and personal um, that I've like kind of been really careful about finding that balance because I know that there's sort of a um, there's sort of a I guess like uh, skepticism to accounts that are character accounts or accounts that like specifically try to be one thing, um, especially online now because you see so many people trying to use that as a way to monetize or like this sort of insincere use of the internet to create content for other purposes. And so I like, I like to set up the character thing and then break it by like just interjecting my own voice into it and, and, and is it creating that balance. demarcated when you do that? It's pretty clear it's you. Um, sometimes, sometimes I like I will drop the typos and like tweet as me. And now like I'm in a weird place now, trying to promote the book and also doing it through this account because now I have to like write the jokes and write the content, but also be like, hey, I'm at um, the Rookman Klein Center, and I, yeah. it's like a difficult thing to balance. But I also like trust. Um, people online to be smart enough to like know when when it's me tweeting and when it's like me tweeting as this creative project, um, and I I don't think I need to create like Jonathan Sun author account and like Jomni Sun character account. So yes, yeah. over here and while uh, we're warming up over here, also curious just uh, word or sentence association brands online. Mm-hmm. Do you engage with brands? Do you poke fun at brands? Do you Oh, Ooh, man. their arrival? There are the most successful brand online, I think, at the moment is the Merriam-Webster Dictionary <laughs> Twitter account, um, which is so, uh, it's just at the right place at the right time because it's doing essentially the role of a dictionary in like a social media landscape, right? It actually is reporting on um, which words are looked up now and like ac- the accurate definition of words considering that yes. um, the people in power right now are misusing language so, so badly. <laughs> Um, so I think that's like a very productive brand mm-hmm. in a sense um, because it's using the, the the identity of it to to actually do something. Yeah. Um, fun brands, I guess. Like I used to interact with the Spaghettios account <laughs> um, <laughs> just because I thought it was like hilarious. Um, and this was when like the Spaghettios account had a thousand followers, and I was kind of just like talking to it. Um, <laughs> I got talking to it as a credulous. Like, was it thinking that you were just another consumer, or were you... Oh, I think it was, like, yeah, a little, I was kind of like, well, I love SpaghettiOs, will you send me SpaghettiOs? And I, I, I had this little thing. I actually got two cans of SpaghettiOs. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the funny thing with, with those accounts is, like, the, that social media um, person on that account uh, left at some point. Mm. And you realize it because... Uh, it like became a, less saucy. It became less... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was my alter ego <laughs> speaking. Right. Um, but you, you can tell when that happens. And there's like, I think that's part of the like, skepticism with brands, too, is because you know that it's not 
um, from a personal place, right? You know that yes. it's from this company paying this person to do this. And so, like, to close that SpaghettiO story, a year later, I tweeted back saying, hello, old friend. And, like, they just said, like, hi, if you have a problem with SpaghettiOs, please contact me. And I was like, no! <laughs> it's like the skeleton just reanimated. Yeah. It was undead rather than alive. Exactly, yeah. 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 Hi, Sasha. Hi. Um, so you talked a little bit about the tweet around the mass shooting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, you know, how do you make the kinds of determinations around, oh, we have a lot of those kind of moments these days. Right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, political moments you could engage with. I mean, my question is kind of about, um, you know, how do you determine when and how to use this character to engage with the explicitly political? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem like it happens a lot, so it's like infrequent and occasional. Yeah. And have you been tempted, given the recent yeah. turn of events, uh, to do more of that type of thing. I'm especially thinking about the Supreme Court's hearing of the, uh, the alien ban. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I, think there's, I think it's like such a, a balance because I never want to seem to be um, using like the platform and the account and the voice to sort of um, like pander in a way to like current events and like current issues. Is the audio still working, by the way? I'm just concerned that it's... So sure it's going online. Yes. All right, that sounds more. Yes. Um, so yeah, I never. Yeah, so I never want to like pander to that or um, or or treat it as like a talking point that I could just use to like put something out there. And so I've I've like lately become a lot more conscious of that. And instead, what I've been trying to do is um, find other voices and find other perspectives that I think have um, a more insightful take on it. And um, trying trying to boost those voices instead. Uh, I think it's. Um, I think I have a, like I have a responsibility not only to like speak sometimes, but also just to step back and let others speak. And if I can help those voices get put out there, then I think that's a great way to go about it as well. Another question maybe in the middle. Yeah. Wherever the <laughs> mic can get to, and then up here. I am Justin Emmerich. I don't know if I'm maybe the person that's farthest away. I'm from Ohio. I just happen to be in Boston. Oh, I follow you on Twitter. Hey. I, I feel like we know each other. Well, I know you. Um, <laughs> you don't well know well with I need to like get shirt. retweets by you, so I have 500,000 followers or whatever. Um, I just, a couple things. I'm a teacher, oh, cool. and I just wanted to personally thank you for a few things. First of all, thank you for giving my students that look at themselves as outsiders or fellow aliens um, uh, an avenue, a friend online. Uh, I have multiple students that follow you, and they, they, oh, they are not cool. the kids that talk out or anything, but, but I'll see them retweet you, and, and, and that's pretty impressive. Oh, that's cool. um, second of all, some of your tweets have been excellent just in my, in my classroom to discuss oh, cool. uh, the, the tweet about from the stars, uh, come, like the, the astronaut and, 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 and going back to Earth or going to the stars and just that conversation. Yeah. Um, there was another one about making, um, uh, it, it was along the lines of doing things for others uh, and then that makes you stop doing things for yourself. And it, just yeah. the depthness we've had from 140 characters uh -huh. is, is pretty impressive. My question though is about your book. Okay, how, do you, cool. how do you see this being used, maybe by uh, middle school or high school teachers? Do you see that? Oh man, um, I have not actually thought about that. Uh, let's and if see. you were to prepare a derivative work called a teacher's guide, would uh -huh. you sue? <laughs> I would absolutely not sue. Um, I think well, part of like the academic side of this was um, again like creating a metaphor. Like I think the mission for this was to kind of to take that um, like the writer, author, illustrator type book and update it for, um, for an audience that kind of is primed for social media now, and like for, for an attention span or for, I mean attention span is such a shitty word, so not an attention span, uh, for just like uh, primed for like that sort of narrative form, I guess. And so this really reads as um, both like a, a concise narrative piece that has a beginning, middle, end, but also um, jumps around characters a lot and jumps around different narratives and things intersect and, um, weave in and out, uh, much in the same way that I've observed the timeline, like the Twitter timeline or the social media timeline working. And so part of the mission, like the theoretical mission of this book was to take that type of online narrative and um, put it into, I guess, like a more traditional form. So I don't know if that helps. Um, but yeah, and then the other character, like the other thing is like all the characters sort of represent a different, um, a, a different kind of idea or um, anxiety or, or st like personal internal struggle of mine. And so I like feel like I've split myself into like eight, 10, 15 different characters and kind of am working through them 
by working on the book. And so I hope maybe there's a character guide or something as well. And just as a quick uh, follow-up on that, what's your view on Remix, as yeah. it were? Especially, I mean, this is probably the wrong example to suddenly uh, tilt everything towards, but Pepe the Frog is been right. one of the most yeah. remixed, transformed right. characters in history. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about if kids or others were to take up your own characters, add one yeah. or two, d deploy them in their own directions? Right. It's such an interesting thing, because like, the internet has like thrived so much on remix culture, right? But I think, um, and I don't know what like the, the IP or like the copyright side of things are, or just like the the ownership side of things. Um, I would love for the for this book to kind of be um, taken and and like used however um, the internet wants it to to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> but like I mean, I've been I've, I've, I've been telling everyone like who wants to use it as a coloring book to like use it as a coloring book. Like it's it's their book when they have it. It's it's no longer um, mine when it when it's kind of in your hands. And so, but like I've, he could assign his students if they wanted to write some continuing adventures. Yeah, you could I even see doing some yeah. templates. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind I mean, of like a green screen challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's something that um, I think that's inevitable anyway, and that's for me. Like, I spent so much of my high school writing like fan fiction and like writing, taking like characters that already exist and imagining them in new situations. Who were your favorites? Uh, I like I wrote an Indiana Jones comic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, like this like graphic novel that I think it was about. What was it about? It was about the Monkey King, um, and it was kind of like based on an, as an existing script that got denied for like the fourth Indiana Jones. Do you realize your agent is like, come on, <laughs> hold this baby <laughs> yeah, out? Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, but like I mean, so many of I think the ways young writers learn to write and to, to create work is by looking at existing things and taking the pieces that they love and trying to like imagine those in new situations. Mm -hmm. So there's no way I would ever want to deny that as well because that's how I learned how to do all this stuff like I I grew up like drawing Calvin and Hobbes over and over again until like I figured out how to draw and how like to do, how to make narrative in visual ways just by like copying um, my favorite art and kind of like working mm. and playing with that so mm. yes uh, so I first found your um, Twitter account when I was a graduate student living abroad so it was yeah. a really like kind of cool thing to see. Um, cool. But secondly, um, my question is, uh, how do you find that your creative process differs between platforms where you do stand-up and you do Twitter and you do your book and um, architecture? Like, is, is it the same or are there distinct um, processes that you go through? Um, I think it starts out the same. Like, I think it starts with like a spark of an idea and then um, it's about, for me, it's about like figuring out where that is supposed to be slotted in, or which like mediums I want to play in. Um, I like. I think the way my brain works is that if there's something I'm a fan of, I really just want to like do something in that style or in that genre or in that um, in that platform, right? And so uh, for me, it's kind of what what the idea is and where I think it should go and like what I want to play with at the moment. So um, whether that's like taking this one-liner thing and trying to turn it into a play or um, thinking about like a space and saying, oh, this is like, this would be really cool if there was like a thing here and then working um, to create like an installation that's like site specific for that, for that place. Um, but it all comes from like the idea first and, and seeing, for me, it's also like what the challenge is, right? Like um, not, maybe not necessarily taking it uh, the most simplest way. Like for the book, this was originally um, supposed to be like a web comic. And I just thought, like, maybe I, I just illustrate my tweets and put it out, like, three times a week and just make it a thing. But then I was like, but this would also be way more confusing and headache-inducing if I tried to make it a book. So I'm going to do that <laughs> instead. Um, but I think, like, that challenge is, like, part of the fun, right? Like, I think at the heart, um, at the heart of it, like, creativity is just puzzle solving. Um, and so that's how I approach, I think, everything that I do. Isaiah Berlin had this uh, distinction between a fox and a hedgehog mm -hmm. um, for academics. And among other things, I don't mean to accuse you, but you are an academic sure, yes. pursuing a doctoral degree. Correct. Um, and the fox is somebody who is uh, into a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And just any new thing might interest the fox. Sure. Write something here, build something there, cartoon mm -hmm. something there. 
Uh, and I think Berlin was on Team Fox. Mm. And a hedgehog is like, I'm going to get really good at this one right. thing, like yeah. sound or whatever it sure. is. You get yeah. really good as a hedgehog. And um, a lot of these fields that you have interest and talent in, design, engineering, writing, mm. they do require layers of stuff. And here you are pursuing a doctoral degree, right. which is the yeah. ultimate like year after year of uh -huh. hedgehoggy. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. So I'm just, uh, this is a little bit Barbara Walters, what's next? Yeah. Right. But, um, what's next for John's yeah. son? And is it continuing to do spread spectrum or you know, might it be yeah. like, I'll see you all in five years after I've built a new airport for Belgium? Sure, yeah. Uh, I actually don't know. I think, like, my role as an academic has been um, an interesting one because, like, partially what inspired this work is um, the, the fact that I was here and feeling very lost and having a lot of imposter syndrome. And I thought, like, well, the thing that I actually have a grasp on that, um, that can, like, ground me is by working on something creative. And, um, and something that I feel like I have control over because sometimes I think academia, um, maybe just for me, um, like in a place like this, surrounded by like geniuses and feeling totally overwhelmed, is, um, is there's this, like there's a lot of pressure involved with that. Um, oh, I don't know him. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think I, I do want to like continue working on the PhD, but I want to find like creative ways to, to like to do that. And yeah. And maybe uh, think a bit outside of the box and, and figure out how to how to make that happen. Got it. One more question from this zone. I realize I've been positioned diagonally, wherever the mic finds itself. Hi. Um, so you've been talking a lot about sort of different identities and separation between identities, mm -hmm. um, and also about different disciplines. And when I read through this, you're an architect, designer, engineer, artist, playwright, yeah. comedy writer, <laughs> and also you refer to yourself as an author and illustrator, which sort of combines two mm -hmm. separate things. Mm -hmm. um, do you see all of these as separate identities or lives, or are they all sort of expressions of you? Are, are there overlaps between them, or are they separate entities? Uh, I think they're like total, I think they're all part of the same thing. Like I don't really see them as like separate things at all. Um, just because like I, I think I just want to make things for like my entire life. And so for me, it's just about like what what the f where the fun is in like making the the thing. I'm so trying to figure out what food you would prepare if you were a chef. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really like, good at that Italian. cinnamon in the steak. <laughs> You're like it's a typo. Right. <laughs> it's an intentional one. <laughs> <laughs> the recipe called for cardamom. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I do think it's, uh, I, I consider it all the, uh, all the same. And um, I'll have you over for dinner one day. <laughs> and, and we'll see. Very good. Saul Tenenbaum, maybe for a last question. Make it a good one. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I actually, it's a quick follow-up to the typo question. Sure. Is the B in alien meant to be silent, or is it alien? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, like, I've I've always thought of um, like the typos as a purely text-based medium, and it's meant to be read and not spoken. Like, I, I think of like Twitter as this thing that the power of it is that the reader is kind of filling in the voice in their head, and it's not meant to be performed, right? And so, obviously, I have this problem where I'm promoting a book with a typo in it, and I don't know what to do with it. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'd rather just hold it up and let everyone read it and say, memorize this book. This is what it's called. Um, but I've been calling it Alien just because I think part of it is like, these are, um, are uh, keyboard typos, and so they're still intended to be spoken as words. There's just a massive SIC at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, they've had to do that a lot in like the press releases and stuff. <laughs> yeah. We actually have time for one more bonus question, unless there's something more you want no, to no, ask I, everybody no, no, let's, or let's, say. Let's, let's, let's do yeah, one more. One yeah. more. Back here. Uh, well, th this is much more uh, personnel, uh, sure. a, a bit more intrinsic. Looking at what you do, uh, and the range of several things that actually catches your interest. Uh, how do you send to, what's your me time like? You know, what do you do? What's your ideal 24 hour scenario? Oh, yeah. You know, how do you, what do you do? How do you prioritize things? Do you take a particular thing a day or you just move from one thing to the other within the span of 24 hours? Oh man, I'm like very bad at any structure and any schedule. And I think like part of it is, um, I, I think I, I have like, uh, 
a strange tendency to fill up free time. Like I feel like if I have free time, I'm doing some, I'm like wasting it in a way. And so it, it it's maybe an unhealthy habit, but I, I do tend to kind of see that and be like, oh, I need to find a way to fill this and then whatever kind of interesting way I can do to be productive um, is the thing I'll follow and then I'll look up at the clock and it's four in the morning and I'll be like, oh, this was a bad idea again to do this. <laughs> um, so I, I have very little structure and I'm trying to work on it. <laughs> and is it right to describe you as an introvert? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, it's just the way you recharge is to do something but alone. I actually like, yeah, I really like making and I think the thing that um, my, the thing that like drives me is just kind of the fact that I can look at something the day after and be like, oh, there was nothing here before. And now there's like a thing here. And all that happened was I like sat down and I like, I willed it into existence. And isn't that cool? And like, yes. now can't I share it with everybody yes. and, and be like, you can do this too. And isn't that cool? Yes. So. A mere hour ago, there was a big pile of burritos. Mm -hmm. There are fewer. <laughs> and uh, yet we are enriched. And we <laughs> for the use of this hour. Yes. And Jonathan, thank you so much oh, for coming you. out and uh, for giving us so much to follow oh, in you. your exemplary work. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>